going to do this thing? I don't know, whatever we're doing this morning. What are we doing this morning? D. D. Good morning, New Trail. Good morning. Ah, we're small but mighty this morning, right? Rodeos and fairs, kind of keeping us all busy. Vacations. All right, let's stand up and let's begin giving our praise and worship to the King of Kings. Well, I looked over, over Jordan, Jordan and, and what did I see? Come and for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sing chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I'm sometimes up and sometimes down, coming for to carry me home. a scripture to read. Would you come on up and read that? joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bill.
to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and hear my broken spirit. Then some spirit, Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Saturday, it's the All Church Spruce Up Party. We're going to call it a party because it's going to be fun if we're all together working together. It's really important that we get this done. We will have uh, brethren in Christ, people from all, uh, literally all over the world here. And so we want to make sure that we're just putting our best, best forward and um, we've got everything taken care of for that day. There's all sorts of things to do. It's not just a girl thing guys we need some muscles okay general assembly so our church has been asked at general assembly and we're planning on just to tell you the magnitude of this 550 ish people okay we have been asked to serve a kind of a midwest barbecue meal something that's the flavor of the midwest so that is what we're doing but we need a lot of help that it's um on Sunday, July 24th, and there's just it's gonna take about 40 people to pull it off. So if you have that afternoon free, I have a sign-up sheet out on the sign-up table out there along with the snack sign-up sheet. Please put your name and your phone number down and <clears throat> we just need to get an army together, okay? Pastor Stan. Good morning, New Trail. Good morning. Now, you know what? There in the United States, we have a volunteer army, and then there's the draft. If you don't volunteer, the draft will be implemented. Absolutely. <laughs> Is that a good way to say it? Absolutely. Is that, we want you to know. We, yeah. Well, you know what, we really, this is a real blessing for them to come to New Trail and ask New Trail if we would do this. It's an honor. And yeah. it's a really quite an honor to uh, be able to do that. So we want to give the flavor of who, really what we are as a church, but yeah, we are as a conference. And, uh, 
In fact, I, I think we're the only, there's, because there's going to be some meals just throughout conference. Jimmy gonna, John's is one of them. Jimmy John's. We can beat Jimmy John's, We are guys. the only, I think, church that's actually serving a meal. Yeah, we are. And so I think that's something spe special. So, you know what? I feel blessed to be a pastor of a church that's been asked to do that, but it puts a lot of responsibility on us, doesn't it? But we look forward to that. So, you bet. It's good to see you this morning. I'm glad those of most that were in Concordia last night are wide awake, I think. And alert here this morning, as uh, we didn't, any, nobody had bull injuries last night. Praise God. Awesome. Right, Terry? You're okay. You know, you know Terry, you. <laughs> and uh, Brian, Brian's not here today. I'm, I think he's still not feeling real hot. He wasn't feeling real hot last night, I found out. Say what? Yeah, he's, he's still not feeling real hot, he said. So, anyway, but you know, one of the things about, I just want to say, though, that we're going through some things that I tell you what, uh, as we're learning to fight from a position of victory, we are in that position. But we're going through some things here, individually in the sense of health-wise. And this morning I just want to highlight those just for a moment, but then talk about the greatness that we have in Christ Jesus. I look here, and, and I just was blessed to see Deanna here this morning, but Dan uh, has not been feeling well of late. And uh, yesterday, because... That last things, our last three days have been busy for me. So uh, it was yesterday you texted me and said you'd gone to ER with him. Found out uh, that his thi thi thyroid, I don't know how long, has not been working. And so that messes a lot of things up inside the body. And, of course, he's going through uh, follow-up treatment regarding his surgery. And he'll be going back uh, to work on some things with the hernia. But so we need to really be praying and just claim the power of God. And uh, we're going to do something a little different as we come to prayer time here in a moment. Larry, some of you miss Callie, but remember, Larry's on Callie, <laughs> but Larry has really been struggling with uh, what's called migraine clusters, and, uh, and yesterday was a better day, but he was in the emergency room and stayed overnight, Friday night at Irwin Hospital in Fort Riley, and uh, so he is, this morning, woke up and was not feeling good, so we want to pray for him, we miss him, and... Uh, and so on. Then Ruth, you know, bless Ruth, one of our prayer warriors, you know, which all of you are. But the fact is, uh, Ruth is really, she did a little damage somehow out in the yard on her foot. And as Ruth is at 88, almost 89 or 80, maybe 89, oh, it's no problem. I'm fine. There's a problem. It's called infection. And, uh, and so uh, she's having to be very careful. And so uh, be praying for her. And uh, we're going to pray for him this morning. But the fact is, I want to share that with you. But I also want to share the fact is, Brother Bill, thanks for the word. That was good this morning from God's word and encourage us. And I just want to add to that, not that we can add. You never can add to the word. The word is the word in every part. And in, in, uh, in Proverbs 2, it says this, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your eye, ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, note that. If you call out for insight, see, God will give it to you if you ask for it, as you study it, and cry out for understanding. And if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Isn't that awesome? And what God wants to do, we're here today to grow in the knowledge of God today and to be people after his heart. And I'm, you know, I just, uh, I know these individuals are not here today that we are concerned about and we seek after God and and I was just sitting here we were standing here and Deanna and I said and I said Satan is trying to attack and she goes and she said we're gonna whip him I said he's already whipped we just gotta stand on the authority of Jesus amen and uh, what I'd like to do this morning I think it's important in, to do you know sometimes the persons can't be here but you know what we have loved ones here that we can pray in proxy shall we say God can cover it so you know what Marlene I'm going to have you represent Ruth today. And so uh, I'm going to make you come up here. I'm going to have you come up here. Deanna, you're here representing your good husband. And, uh, and Lynn's right there. And so you stay there, Lynn. Don't move. <laughs> but you know what? We need to pray. Amen? Amen. And I'm just going to invite those who want to come. I'm going to ask you three. We're going to put them in a cluster close together here. And we just want to pray. So you want to come and pray? Lay hands and come up forward. And we just want to pray in Jesus' name. And uh, I just feel it's important we do that right now and so uh don't forget lynn folks 
So we go up with Lynn there. And uh, go up, Lynn, hey, just go up on the platform there, Lonnie. Because you look stretched out there. <laughs> and so, and so. Okay, stand for Brian, yes. Amen, yes. So uh, Kristen is standing in for Brian today. So, And the rest of you there, just extend your hands out in prayer as we pray. And as I'm praying, I'm just going to anoint with oil and saying, God, we're just claiming. I know they haven't asked. The Bible tells us in James, we're called to elders, it says, and ask for what? Pray for healing in Jesus' name. Amen. And it says the, in the same passage of what the effectual fervor of prayer of a righteous man does. It accomplishes much. And uh, that's what we're doing right now. And so, so, well, Shirley's got good reports. We're just praising her. Is she having some more? That's right. That's right. Shirley, where are you at? Get up here. <laughs> Get up here. <laughs> that sounds very rude. And I want to say something while she's coming. I owe you an apology as your pastor. Last Sunday, I was, I love when I have people who come and say, you know, Pastor, there was a part of your sermon you got a little uh, sharp. And sometimes that happens. And I want to apologize for that because we're called to be grace, you know, and to be gracious. Yeah, we can speak to sin, and we all have made mistakes. Have we all been made mistakes? And we've had to pay the price. But the fact is, I made a statement the way I spoke, and I'm not going to repeat it because I don't want to give credence to Satan. But the fact is, I apologize for it being very uh, abrupt and very rude in my message, and I apologize for that. And so uh, we just want God's grace to be evident in ministering to all our people, fluid in his spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name. We just, uh, we just are blessed. We have individuals that are standing here uh, in proxy. And those who are suffering greatly, we know that through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors. We have already won the victory. You are blessed. Just go ahead and do it with you. Thank you. And Lord, we just pray. Number one, Lord, we don't pray in wonderment or hopefulness. We pray in the clarity of God's victory already through Jesus Christ. We pray for Larry. Lord, we come against those migraine clusters. I, Lord, I, I, every pulsating vein that tries to constrict and cause great pain, we come against it in Jesus' name. We want him freed forever from the, in this. You know, when he it drives him to his knees. And, Lord, we want him to be his knees because he wants to be there in prayer, <laughs> not because of headaches. And so we claim the victory in Jesus' name for him. We thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name for him. And go to right across just east of Enterprise, Lord, right now, and go to where he's at. And just touch him and lift him up. And may there be the witness of the power of the Holy Spirit upon him. We declare him free of those migraines right now in Jesus' name. We think of Brian, who still really, uh, his body just, he did, last, last, last night, I just kept saying, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. But he said, uh, I said, the vitamins have any effect? And he said, yeah, some. But he said, I just constantly feel tired. And the bottom line is, the fact is, we know what, when he went the major bout of COVID, we know that's kicked his body hard. So, Lord, we come against every cell that's been brought down and made weak. We pray renewed of the Holy Spirit's touch of every cell of his body to make him a whole man in Jesus' name. And, Lord, as Krista stands here and she's concerned about him, and so rightfully so as all of us are, we pray for his renewal of body and renewal of his spirit. And uh, just know that he is really, really having a battle. So, Lord, the battle we sometimes take on, and we forgot it's already been won. Let's just, we just stand in the victory of what's been done in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we pray for Dan. Lord, uh, I knew, I just knew that he hadn't been feeling real good because just some, he said a week or a half ago or so, a couple weeks ago. But we didn't know what all was, but now we do. And, Lord... Something wants to shut down, and we're saying in Jesus' name, we want it to restart. Not because of our demand, but because you want every part of his body to function properly. So we pray for that thyroid right now. That right now in White City, would you go right there at the house where he's at? And I pray that you would just touch his body and let that thyroid begin to operate. Be able to do the cleansing it's supposed to do. And all that of helping the body to be stimulated to what it's supposed to be doing. For the glory of, of your name and for his for strength of his body. So, Lord, we just are thankful that you are doing that in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, we know that there's the hernia to be repaired. 
And uh, we just know you give the doctors clarity on that. We don't know what other things they're going to find. But, Lord, right now, we're claiming for the surgeon of all surgeons to touch his body, the healer of all healers to touch him. That is you, our Lord and Savior. So, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would do that as we thank you and we declare it done. We stand upon the promises of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord. The Lord, we think of Ruth. Oh, Lord, uh, Ruth. She, it's kind of dull without her around, it, not her here. But Lord, we, we miss her. And Lord, uh, she's kind of stubborn, you know, and uh, she's, she just thinks she's still young yet. And Lord, we love, Lord, may we be that way at 88 or 89. And I pray, Lord, though, you would touch that foot where there's an infection. And let it not go any further than just take that, take every poison out of her system, everything that's been, dis- is being compromised. In Jesus' name, we just thank and stand upon your promises and what your God, you're doing for her. And so, Lord, uh, we just want her raised up. We want her amongst us, as we want all these individuals amongst us. But, Lord, we just want her to be fully healed because we just know that uh, she just delights in the joy of the Lord. And, and uh, Lord, we know it's even affected her a little bit because uh, she called me, and I was in the middle of funerals when she did it. And the fact that she didn't remember calling me. Lord, that, that happens sometimes when there's affection by the affects the mind. And so, we, Lord, we want her mind to be clear. We want it to be unhindered by anything. So she can be fluid and fluid and flowing in the Spirit of God. So, Lord, we just thank you for the healing upon her body in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we thank you for this word this week for Shirley. Both two doctors, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Beck, have said, we can't see any cancer. Praise God. We give you glory. We praise God for that, Lord. And we know there's one more test this week. And, Lord, we're just going to say, God, in Jesus' name, we're declaring nothing there in the other part of her body. That all the cells that might try to destroy her body, those things that we call cancer, we don't let them be part of her at all. And we just thank you for the word of promise. We also thank you for the victory of already what is already going to be found to be, that I call empty, because it's no, the disease has no part of her body right now. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We just pray the glory of God. As a church family, let's not be afraid to be assaulting the gates of glory. Because you know what? We have already won the victory through Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, we are the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, we are not God himself, but we have the character of God within us to be victors. And we are victors and we are overcomers. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. We love you. We praise you. May the glory of Christ rest upon this service today. As we soon now will be singing more praises, but we also will be also giving in a way of our tithes and offerings and saying, Lord, we love you. Because we thank so much, you gave us so much, we're just giving back to you. We love you with all our heart. We praise you, and we give you all our love and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said together, all of us, amen Amen and amen. 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 God bless. Amen. Well, let's praise the Lord as as we're already doing, and just seek God as we sing and praise as we give to the Lord as well. There we go. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians and our love. By our love, yes, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is By our love, by our love, yes, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side, we will work with each other, we will work side by side, and we'll go. Christians 
stop you in your steps. For he is a liar. He'll grab your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire. Cause fear, he is a liar. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I fear. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I fear. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I fear. Let's do that again. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I fear. Oh, fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. our fear in the fire that is the holy spirit Amen. that is what god wants is the power of the holy spirit in each of us to be flowing and overpowering and victorious and rent you know as we hear brother rent keep saying i want us to understand of entering that sabbath rest being in the rest of jesus being in the confidence of jesus being in the fact is that whatever might come you know what say I'm under the covering of the Holy Spirit. You can't touch me. Amen. That's what it's about. And we give it all up to Him. Yeah. Lord, we thank You for Your Holy Spirit. We thank You for the victory we have because of the Holy Spirit. And we stand in the promises of the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said res resoundingly, Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Oh, what a great song. Great song. So, well, I'll tell you what, it's good to be among the family of God this morning, be with you. Uh, I, uh, I feel kind of spoiled being pastor here, I really do, and, uh, and I guess that's not a bad place to be, is to be spoiled, is, uh, you know what, when there's a love in the body of Christ and you feel the love of God, that's important, and uh, there's children. You're ready to go to Children's Church. God bless you as you go. But I tell you what, I just want to say I just love you as a church family. You're great, and God is working among us, and we just believe good things are days ahead, and we're just going to keep looking forward to what God's going to do. Well, you know, I really don't want to say this this morning, but I want to because I have to. I think of where we live, and I love where we're at. I love the Midwest. I love Kansas. I love where we're at here. But you know what's happening? We are getting cooked in a slow boil. You know the old adage about the frog in the kettle? And the furnace, the, the, the heater gets turned up in the bottom, and then what happens to the water? It goes from cool, and the frog is enjoying himself, but soon the frog is what? Boiled and dies. 
I am concerned about us as a people because I love our culture where we're at and we feel, I'm going to say, we feel a false sense of security here in this area. And I'll tell you why. You go to the city and you see sin slammed in your face really, really obvious. We out here, we kind of, we know what we believe. We're more conservative as we think about who we are. But what's happening is Satan's trying to cook us by slowly turning up the thermostat. Got what's that? Got a ninja thing going? <laughs> Brother Marshall's into kung fu over here. Got the ninja thing going. <laughs> but he's right. And, I, and I'm concerned about that. And I, this is a message that's a little different this morning. But I want us to be attuned to the danger of what's happening as we're hearing things that are not new, but they have new terms. And I'm going to speak just to one of them this morning that we're being slowly cooked with. And it's called the cancer, cancel culture. It's been around a long time. We go back to World War II in 1930s on, there was a cancel culture going on then. You say, what do you mean by cancel culture? If you're not really paying attention, let me just tell you something here. Let me just describe it for you. Because it doesn't have a singular leader. And I say, yes, it does. You just can't touch him. It's called Satan. He's using people in the masses and in, in, and in volumes of various instances of culture. Whether it's in education, whether it's in the governmental realm, or wherever realms, we are seeing it in so many subtle places. And this is how it's described as you, if you look it up and see what is the premise of cancel culture. And it's this. Cancer culture, or call-out culture as it's often called, is a phrase contemporary to the late 2010s and 2020s. Used to refer to a form of ostracization, that means pushing aside, in which someone is thrust out of social or professional circles, whether it be online, on social media, or in person. Those subject to this ostracization are said to have been canceled. It happened back in the 30s and in the 40s. Six million of them got canceled. It was called Jews. Because Hitler did not see a place for them because he hated them and he saw them as being the destruction of, Jew, uh, of Germany as he thought from World War I. And he gave them all the credence and all the, gave them more credence than they probably deserved but they were the ones that were hated. And guess what he did? He began to, began to ostracize them slowly. And then it became very outward. The, knife, the Night of Knives, a famous night where they attacked all the Jewish shops in the areas of Germany first. And then when they went into Austria there in Austria and other places that begin and wherever they found Jews they begin to ostracize them. that means separate them make them like they were a very I call a pyra a pyra is a word for like a, a disease and pushed away and people were not to associate with them and people paid the price to help protect them people such as Corey Tim Boom who was well known through her ministry with uh, uh, with, with uh, Billy Graham and others and Anne Frank was a Jew and we read their diaries of Anne Frank as she herself was a Jew and hidden, of course, and was found not long before Rhea, that area would have been liberated. But the bottom line is this, what's happening, and, and we're seeing culture being pushing us and forming us, and you say, what do you mean us? I want to tell you something. There's a movement by Satan called, I want to get rid of the church. I want to get rid of the church. We're going to be pushed aside. The fact is, because let's face it, look at over the last 200 and some years of our country, almost 250, the church was a significant part of the building of America. The church was impacting the culture. If the people, and a lot of people have given our, for, our forefathers as they were Christians, some of them were deists, which meant they believed in God but didn't know if they, they had a relationship with Jesus, but some of them were clear followers of Jesus Christ. But the bottom line is this, there was a premise that was biblical. Even then, even Ben Franklin, who was at best deist, even said, we cannot do anything apart from the power of God. That was Benjamin Franklin, who didn't live the most upright life, quite frankly, if you know his lifestyle. But the bottom line, he understood, nowhere can this government go, this country go, without the power of God. Well, I'll tell you something. In all that understanding, the fact is what happened is the church was able to have a great influence because it was understood as you understand the Constitution and you need to read your Constitution. The fact is, you know what? It was written by Thomas Jefferson, who himself was a deist at best, 
and himself, that he said, the church can have an influence in the culture, but the government should never influence the church. That was his understanding. And see, we've got all that messed up nowadays. That's why I'm a constitutionalist. Your pastor is a constitutionalist. What's that? Because I want to tell you something. We are not a democracy. We are a republic. Get that right. And if you understand the word democracy and what it means broken down in part, the fact is it isn't about the rule of the people. The republic means the rule by the people. Guess what? Your people that we have voted into place, they are not the leaders. They are representatives of people called you. They're called the lead. And if we have people are in the Word of God and following the Word of God as much as a lot of culture was in the past in America, and we saw the Judeo-Christian belief system controlling America, we saw that God prospered and He blessed us because we were trying to be obedient to Him. And also, let me just add here, because we have some, even our own denomination, I don't like, they're speaking, that we're saying, the fact is, they're saying, we're not sure we should be before the Jewish people. Now, folks, I want you to know something. You look through history. Any nation that turned their back on the Jewish people, look what happened to that empire or that country. The British Empire in 1918, when they turned their back on Israel, it began to go down. You look through all history that's happened. Folks, we've had leaders who have pronounced, and then we had a pronounced a leader who went back in and said, we're moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Because he was going to say, Israel is important. They are God's people. Now we have leadership that doesn't want to go there. Guess what? When the final decision is made that we're going to reject Israel, the, cat, the last rock will fall out from under us. We'll be done. Because God wants his people to be blessed by the people around him. They are to be a blessing and we are to be a blessing to them. So I want you to understand something. What's happened is that now we're getting pushed aside is that we as a church and we as a cultural, supposed to be changing entity, we are being told where that we are warmongers we are homophobic we are given many terminologies pushing us and saying they are dangerous in fact i just heard our president this week as he still was speaking to the issue of the uh, uh, the supreme court's decision the fact is that we have these dastardly it wasn't the word to use but i'm going to say it was it was on the same line as dastardly movements that are dangerous in america and he was talking about those who stood for life no, I don't say amen. Uh-uh, Gary. You better listen. You better listen carefully, Gary. I was not saying amen to that one. Because <laughs> I want you to know something. I am for life. We as a church are for life. And we support life for the glory of Jesus Christ. And we are called to because I want you to know if it wasn't for my mom and dad, I wouldn't be here. So I'm thankful for life. Now understand this. What's happening is we're seeing a culture that's causing us to look like we are the dangerous ones. We are being ostracized. The cancel culture is trying to cancel the church out. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This morning, my points are not my points. But somebody I read through an institute, a Christian institute for liberty, and I'm afraid they point out five things why we, what the cancel culture says and what we understand is unbiblical. Okay? So I want, it's a different message this morning. I'm speaking about cultural dynamics that's going on. And I want you to be with me this morning. But I want to take first to the book of Matthew, chapter 10. And not that I want to take just one verse, but I'm going to bring it in context. Because Jesus is about to send the 12 disciples out. And you know what? He knows what's going to happen. That's why he sent them out two by two, not lone rangers. <laughs> he, they could support each other, care for each other, to to pray for each other all those things he tells them what to do is if they're received to go in and receive that gifted a uh, blessing from those people if we're rejected shut the shake the dust off your feet and move on and we move on but then come to verse 21 it says brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death verse 22 is what i want you to note you will be hated by everyone because of me that's jesus talking but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved when you're persecuted in one place flee to another truly i tell you you will not finish going through uh the towns of israel before the son of man comes i want to tell you something here i want verse 22 stands out to me because it says you will be hated by everyone because of jesus because of me he says 
Folks, are we feeling a hatred? Sure we are. We're trying to be part compartmentalized, put aside. I don't, don't, don't tell me what I want to do or not do. I have my rights. <laughs> the woke movement, which we, that's another message in itself. Let's tell you, we woke up to what the realities are. Well, guess what? The only thing they haven't woke up to is the reality of sin. <laughs> but the point is this. In this passage of scripture, I want you to understand something here. It says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Folks, I want to speak about the cancel culture because I want you to understand what we're facing and know how to stand to the end. All right? I want to encourage us. I don't want us to be defeated, but I want you to know what the th culture is thinking. Number one, the cancel culture teaches the sin of partiality. Partiality means partially some of you are okay. Brother Bill, you're okay. But Thomas, uh-uh. Because Bill's on my side. He thinks like I do. And therefore, because he doesn't, you, Thomas, don't think like us, therefore, we don't need you anymore. Say, what's that? Uh, no. <laughs> For those online that didn't hear that, I said, he, he's a, Thomas over here is a dyed-in-the-wool K-State fan. We'll forgive him anyway. <laughs> sorry, D sorry, Dave. Back day. Every time I go to the Myers' home, I have to drink out of a K-State glass. <laughs> and I know it's designed intentionally when I show up. There's the K-State glass. And, you know, we're ha whether it's a meal or just where they're just there in the afternoon or whenever I'm there, the fact is there's that K-State glass. And I know it's by design. <laughs> I, can, I can live with OU, but not that much. Um, you know, i got to be careful here what I say. But anyway, but the fact is, and that's a good illustration because is, I remember how Bryce felt the first time we went to K-State, Oklahoma State game, because we're Oklahoma State fans, particularly my son. And the thing about it is, the first time we've gone and where we get, and we have there, and pretty soon this guy, people are coming in and to some people from K-State going, oh, where are you guys from? And Bryce goes, Abilene. And the gentleman goes, you mean down the road, Abilene? Yeah. He said, but you're wearing orange. And Oklahoma, he goes, yeah, I'm an Oklahoma State fan. Oh. Anyway, so anyway, so what happened is what, I just love this. What happened is the crowd became, and suddenly there was just, and I wasn't wearing orange. He was. And he said, man, this is a little overwhelming. All the purple around him. And I said, now you know how the Christians felt when the lions were about to get him. <laughs> but you know what? He in some way felt, without meaning to be that way, he felt what? Ostracized, separate, didn't he? The K-State group, or the Oklahoma State group was down at the end of the end zone, really the most of them there, and that's where they go. But I want to tell you something, this is a greater significance of understanding partiality. That is a sin, because nobody is to be partial to anybody else. Everybody is valuable in the sight of God. We might think differently. I mean, I want you to know, I have friends who think absolutely opposite of me in our social and moral issues, or actually ethical issues and some of the social issues. But the fact is, you know what? I still love them. I'm not going to say, well, I can't talk to you more because I'm not on the same page with you. No, God, that's a sin. And I bought, the scripture backs that up. You have your Bible, turn to James chapter 2 and verse 9. James 2 and verse 9. We're still be going some scriptures this morning, as we always should be. But I want you to know something. In James chapter 2, verse 9, we see here these words. But if you show favoritism... You sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. I want to tell you something. We're not called to be separated and call separation. The fact is, because you know, remember I told yesterday I was at my yesterday I was at the the remembrance of uh, Cecilia, my classmate, and uh, I was talking to someone. I said, "Yeah, Cecilia and I and and another classmate of mine, well, we were in a group and at school, and I've shared this in the past with you." about my teacher who challenged me with the question when she realized that one person influenced her life was Jesus and she just wiped off everybody else and she came after us and the fact is she said do you think you're a bigot of course at that time I was a senior in high school what's a bigot <laughs> and then she said you're better than everybody else well what's that saying the fact is what's happening in our culture today these people think that they have the truth and they're right and therefore we are wrong and they're going to shove us out and that's what she was trying to say do you think you're so good you're better and you said the only person that makes me good is jesus <laughs> i'm not better than them because there by the grace of god goes what goes i 
We need the grace of Jesus Christ. I am no better than anybody else in this room. Last night coming home, uh, we were, Terry was talking about his ornery past. But the fact is, and he was talking about some things and some characteristics. And the fact is, guess what? I might not have done the same things Terry did, but you know what? I was just as much a sinner as he was back here. It was, amen? I mean, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, we've come to know Christ. And we are now the same through Christ. I'm not better than somebody else, but the one who's in me is better. He's the glory. He's perfect in every way. Amen? Amen. So we see here then, and we can read also the same in Deuteronomy 117. You can turn there. It says, the day, it's a sin to be show favoritism or partiality. The fact is to say that, oh, these people are better. We're better. Therefore, that's what the cancel culture does. It makes people feel like they're not worthy and they shove it aside. The second thing we see that does, it taints God's image bearers. Who's God's image bearers? Hello? Who's God's image bearers? Amen. By the way, look to the person right and left, front and back. Guess who else is God's image bearers? You are. But you know what the council culture says? The fact is only certain people really deserve God's, uh, well, they don't want to use God, but they read because they have a, a secular viewpoint. But the bottom line is this, that they believe the fact is they're the only ones that have favoritism from some entity, and they're right. Let's face it. I just read an update. I understood that the, the one world government wanted to put the world population at 1 billion. I just read recently is now 500 million. Folks, that's half of a billion. The fact is, you know, what they want to do? They want to marginalize you. How are they going to do it? How did Hitler do it? You know what? We look through history. We are going to determine to wipe out, as Albanius once said, we're going to wipe out any vestiges of Christianity today, ever. And they did. In fact, they claimed they were the only country of all the communist countries, the Eastern Bloc, that never have a Bible in it. Now today, guess what God has done? There's a strong church in Albania. You can never defeat the power of God and the Word of God. We might think it looks as defeated, but God always has a remnant. Remember Elijah? What happened to Elijah? Lord, I'm only the only one. There's no, is there nobody else? He said, hold on, I have. How many others? Brother Marshall, how many was there? 7,000? Elijah. Remember? There were 7,000 yet. You know, you say, well, among a whole population, it's not very many. God doesn't need a whole lot to turn the world upside down. He just needs faithful people that are committed to him that have maybe been pushed aside, but God said, you just go ahead and push because he's the biggest pusher of all. The greatest picture I ever saw one time. We always talk about bulls. That bulls are tough. I realized something. You get a good bronc who's huge. He, those bulls have no chance. I'll never forget one time. Sammy Andrew Stock. We were here and it was before a performance. It was early. And we had them already. They had them already prepped in the, the stalls of where they, or the pens they were going to be in before we started this performance. And there was one of these broncs. Huge. He was to many hands. And he was just fuming and foaming and everything else and it was over the two that did not have I call uh, jump and I jump bars and the fact is this bull I mean horse decided to leap over it just no run just over into where two big bulls are at and I will never forget those two bulls suddenly you could see like uh, okay and I thought they'd have an attitude back no that horse literally leaned I mean he didn't stand like this he leaned into him and both those bulls had to give way I'm a man that's power and I thought about that you know what Jesus we might look like there's a minority of us but guess who's the one that's leaning for us it's mighty Jesus our Lord and Savior amen he's in the pen he jumps in and says hold on I'll take care of you let me push these bulls out of the way I loved it. What a picture for me. And I said, can we get the picture? This is what God wants to do for us. But he taint, but the cancel culture taints the image of God's bearers of him. And the fact is, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It's, we're, just going, we're just looking at scriptures that prove of our position with our Lord. Chapter 1, verse 27. Wait till you get there. Because I want you to read this. Because you understand from the beginning what God thought of us. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. By, oh, by the way, male and female he created them. Not it or whatever the person in between is. 
No, there is no such. Male, female. We are made in the image of God. We are made for his glory. We have been touched with his glory. When we get defeated and get down, we're forgetting the fact is we're tainting the image that God made. We're forgetting that we are made in his glory and power. For we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, we might be tainted by culture. We might be ostracized. And I want you to know what's happening because in this culture we feel like it's okay. But I want to just tell you something. How we're seeing ourselves pushed. Because what's happening in our, the economic scheme of, the, of our governmental officials in the world system, guess what's happening? The cost of things for fuel and fertilizers and feed is going up and up. You know what they're starting to see now? Farmers selling big blocks of land because they can't afford anymore. There's a big block just east, west, east of Navarre, 313 acres being ready to be sold. I know whose it is. I like to buy it. Don't have that much money. But the bottom line is this. You know what? Here's the point. These, we're feeling the pressure of this cancel culture. This is a result of it. Come here, folks. They're trying to squeeze people out. Those are just the small. We don't need a small farmer because I want you to know they want a collective system. That was called communism. Collective system was the communism. What's collective? Collective farms where everybody goes there and they farm all the land that's owned by the government. Takes away the self-will and self-drive to produce. And they wonder why it... Russia had such problems. Quite frankly, folks, it looks like Russia is thriving today. It isn't. You just don't know that you're just not inside the infrastructure of all of it. There's, I'm reading some things now on what's going on in Russia. The old communist way is still there, and it's bringing down, again, the image of people feeling valued and worth. The only difference is this. The church has gotten a lot stronger in Russia since then, since the uh, curtain fell in 1989, thanks to God and through people like Mr. Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, Tear this wall down. Well, the bottom line is this. We, are, we realize that the cancel culture is tainting us, saying, you know what? We can pick and choose who we think is the most of importance and value. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? That's the problem is we have the culture saying, you're my type, you're not. And therefore, we're looking at people and saying, you know, they're not worthy. Because the fact is, when we are people that are made to look like we are nothing but bumpkins and stupidity, Guess what? That's what we're being told to look like. We don't, we're, you know, I have to admit it to you. It happens in the church. I've told you once before. I, when I was on the board, the national board of our denomination, we had an a individual who used to be an academic dean and back east. And a friend of mine who served before me was very bright, but he heard a word mentioned by this academic dean. He just simply said, I'm not familiar with that word. And this person speaking, and this is kind of the way we hear in our world, our cancer culture speaking, said this. Oh, I forgot. You're not part of the intelligentsia of the East. Now, doesn't that make you feel so wonderful? It makes you feel so good. What a way to make the body of Christ feel so important. I mean, this is another person claiming no Christ saying it to another one. You're not part of the intelligentsia of the East. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you about the intelligentsia of the East. They're the same ones that many times I flew, many times, many, I've flown millions of miles on the jet. And I'll never forget, I guess I got fed up because I found out so many Easterners still thought, folks, that you were in danger because Indians were still flying around here with their horses and bows and arrows. And I'll never forget, I got fed up to somebody in Chicago O'Hare Airport, and this poor person caught it, and he said, isn't it dangerous? And I said, let me think. I think six arrows hit the fuselage of the jet as I jumped inside. <laughs> it wasn't very nice of me, was it? But the person caught the point. <laughs> but see, that's what's happened in the culture when we come so cloistered and we think and we're just told and we've been pushed into a box and we're made to look like bumpkins that come from somewhere that don't know nothing. See, like from North Carolina, in the hills of North Carolina. <laughs> I give my, my brother Marshall a hard time because uh, he's that country boy of North Carolina. And, but he holds his well own very well on that one. And so he's proud of that. Amen. But you know what? I'm just listening to you this morning. The dangers that we got to be aware of and how to stand firm to the end. The third thing that cancel culture is doing, it taints. I had this all in my head here. Oh, teaches. Coveting versus or as equality, I should say. Let me restate that again. It teaches coveting as equality. You say, well, excuse me? Coveting. What's the Bible tell us? 
We're not to covet what? Our neighbor's wife or anybody else. We're not, that means want it for myself and me only. But the cancer culture is all about the fulfillment of themselves. And therefore, if they get fulfilled or whoever they, they think they're part of and want to be, therefore, it, everything is equal, equitable for everybody because we covet it for us. Why do you think the one world government wants to make the world population of 500 million? You know, you put 500 million around this earth, you know what? You can put a lot of people and never know they were there. But because then they have what's theirs. I own this 10 million acres. And so is my neighbor. Because the less we have, the more we can have. Does that make sense? You said, let me think of that one. The less, I back up, the less there are, the more I can have. Therefore, there's equality. See, that was part of communism, too. We take the government, the, the land from the people, and we can there have it for ourselves, and we can and just have our little pawns farm the land for us. You know, let's face it. Those who have money will do what they can, and they will do, and they'll take care of themselves while the rest suffer. Exodus chapter 20. You have your Bibles? Exodus 20. Book of Exodus. Sex is the book of the Bible. You have Genesis and Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. In verse 17. I've already started to say it. It's the last co commandment of the, of the Ten Commandments. What's it say? You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant. His ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. That's pretty clear. Covet means it's mine. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get. I hate to mention this, but I knew somebody. Now, in fact, God got a hold of him, and he's now a follower of Jesus Christ and changed his attitude completely. But I knew somebody in Navarre, Kansas, who was always in competition with a peer of his who lived on the edge of Navarre. I'll never forget, he was wanting to match him or he had to have the exact same thing as his friend. And I'll never forget, the day that this gentleman got married, my dad did the wedding, this gentleman, not yet saved yet, comes up to him and said, well, I guess you beat me on this one. Hello? I don't know if he meant you got her or you just be, got married first. I think it's probably more at first. But, you know, it was a coveting spirit. I want what you got, or I want to be sure that we have that nobody else has. At least the two of us will be on the same plane. Oh, Lord, this is the cancel culture that's happening to us. We're being shoved aside. We're being taught to covet. That's why they hate when we're, people are starting to push back. I want to tell you something. I don't want to get in the political realm here completely, but I want to tell you something. Do you know what's finally happening in San Francisco? People are starting to push back against the one who controls that area, namely a house, a state rep, a U.S. representative named Nancy Pelosi. Have you seen the pictures? And I have friends from San Francisco. Do you know what San Francisco looks like downtown? It is terrible. Starbucks, who's been supportive of the whole of this I'm talking about. You know what? They even moved out of there. They're moving out. Why? Because they're seeing something there. They're going, see, they thought they wanted this, but then when it shows up in their front door, they don't want it, so they're going to go where they can get their thing yet. See, it's still, they're still selfish. I love how people move from California, like to Texas and everywhere else, but they still want to vote the platform they had there that got them where they're at. Well, you want that there? Go Watch out, because it's going to be the same thing there. That's why we can look at issues like abortion and understand the fact that's part of coveting. You know what that means? You say, well, how is abortion a part of coveting? I covet the life I want, and I don't want anyone to mess it up. And therefore, I will kill a child. No, hear me out. Not a fetus. A child. Made an image of God. Because it messes up my life. I told you last week I believe in pro-choice. But you got to pay the price of pro-choice. You made a choice to get in bed. you got to pay the price. 
we have to be careful, folks, how we speak. But to realize the fact is sometimes we can be supporting some things with a covetous spirit that falls right into this. In other words, the thermostat's been turned up on the water, and we sometimes become part of it. We have to be careful as Christians that we are too don't get into an arrogant spirit. We can cancel people out too. As I've heard people in churches say, we don't want your kind in our church. What's that mean? I share with you the fact is, and somebody we need to be praying for, a lot of you know Lao Tzu. He has just been brought home and put on hospice. But Lyle and Molly were the ones that brought children to church that were unwanted. And sometimes they were challenged as, why do you bring them here? And my thinking is this, why not bring them to the house of God? To hear the hope. And I told Beth the other day, I said, did you see the picture? And there was Molly, and there's a young, name, young lady there. She always called Lyle Molly her mom and dad. She, I forget how long she was with them. She was there when we were the pastor there at Abilene Church. And I'll never forget the fact that I said she's still part of their life. She calls Molly her mom. I was really touched by it. I saw those pictures. She's a grown lady now, probably almost 40. I thought, what a, what a blessing. What a blessing. Because they saw value. And they're willing to sacrifice their place, their, prov their provisions, everything, to have the hope that this, these children were worth everything. They didn't covet for themselves. All they want to do is give. Amen. Hey, thank you for sharing that. And, man, and Awanas? Yep. There at the Abilene Church? You know what? Amen. Let's go home. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Praise God. I've known her for quite a long time, but I didn't know that Molly led you to Jesus. So I look at Molly and I thought, what a story. What a story. Man, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> you know what? That's why we don't cancel anybody out. <laughs> we got to be careful in the church here at Nutria that we don't cancel anybody out. Yes, we were blessed to have... Tra Tracy Mann and his family here, but the fact is we always kind of get excited. Well, okay, well, U.S. representative here, great. But you know what? They're wounded and broken too, aren't they? But guess what? There's people who don't have the same status or status they do, but they're just as broken as Tracy and them and vice versa. Folks, we don't cancel anybody out. But that's what's happening even in the church today. We have churches that are getting separated, and we're wondering why. And there's people who get mad at churches that hold to the biblical standards of Scripture because the fact is they're not buying. We're not buying into the governmental system and all the system of the one world government, all these things. We're not buying into the cancel culture. Why? Because we believe God's word is preeminent and Jesus is Lord. That's why I had to apologize to you this morning because the fact is I don't want anybody to feel they have been put down upon. Now I'm say, will I still speak to sin? I'll still speak to sin. But I don't want to be judgmental in the sense I used some harsh words I shouldn't have used in the spirit of which it came in. Because I'll tell you what, sin is already harsh. We're called to be grace. We're called to be grace, aren't we? So I see the fact is that we've got to be careful that we don't, we've got to realize that they see coveting as equality. In other words, they want to push you out so they can have yours because they want it. But that way, the few of us can have what equal playing. The fourth thing we understand about the critical race understanding is this. They impart guilt to the guiltless. Listen to that one. They impart guilt to the guiltless. In Jesus Christ, we are found guiltless through the redemption of Jesus Christ. But there were the world system, this cancel culture is trying to make us feel guilty for things. Now we'll tell you something. The church ain't perfect. There are a lot of things we've done that we shouldn't have done. But we are still redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ if we know him as Savior. And when I say church, I'm speaking about those who accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And are desirous to walk in the power and the might of the glory of the Holy Spirit. 
in Exodus, back to Exodus chapter 18, verse 20. We'll turn there again. Exodus 18, and verse 20. Verse 19 says, listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions. Show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. And you say, what does that have to do with the guiltless? Bottom line is this. We're teaching people to live in a way of righteousness and holiness. And that we are, the fact is, we realize if we obey what God tells us to do, whatever man might say to try to push us aside, we can say, I'm not guilty, even though they might pronounce us guilty. Folks, the day is getting a lot closer in America to where this will be illegal. And if they want to call me guilty of holding and hiding a word of God, so be it. Because in God's eyes, I am not guilty of anything except obedience to him. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. Hear me carefully. I believe in obeying the law of the land until it comes co direct contradiction to the word of God. Hear me out. And you say, what's that? What is it? Well, I'll tell you what. When they tell me I cannot worship Jesus, you're to worship here. What that? Look at Daniel and the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What they were told to do. You can't worship. You're to go bow down before Nebuchadnezzar, he's about to bow down to the, the idol he made, and they said, uh-uh, no, no. Now, they could have still died, but God intervened and spared them, didn't he? I'll guarantee you, if I die, I've been spared too. I'm in Jesus, I'm with Jesus. But the idea is this, this is not moment. What does it tell us in First Peter? We're but just strangers or sojourners passing through. Folks, some of you got your teeth and your claws too much into this land. It ain't here for long. I'd like I keep telling you, lay in a casket and see how much is yours. Even the casket's going to stink after a while because you're going to stink it up. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? <laughs> yeah, I've watched. I've watched when old graves have been dug up. First of all, it's always a one. I want, it's fun watching the curious until they hit the vault, and then they disappear. But I'll tell you what: even a grave that's been old, there's a certain smell that comes out when that they open it up. Because you know what? The Bible says we go back to what? The dust, what we're made from. But I know something else. God says, you know what? I'll be made perfect in his sight. And I'll be put together perfectly. God wants to be when Jesus shows up again. But I want to tell you something. I don't want to get off the point. We are found to still be guiltless in God's eyes. I'm called to be guilty before man if I need to be when I come with the word of God. See, that's the whole thing. They want to tell you. The, the cancel culture wants you to feel guilty. Because you're not going the way they think you should go. And last but not least, the cancer culture elevates man over Christ. He elevates man over Christ. As I was researching this, and the scripture they gave doesn't really fit for me, and maybe I'm not a real, I thought I was a pretty good interpreter of scripture as I was reading, and as I was looking, and I still haven't got it as I was looking, they gave as I, was, I told you, these are not all my points, and I'll tell you why, because this spoke so well to what we're about. And I want you to understand it, but in Proverbs, they gave me Proverbs 2, 9, and I was looking at it, I'm going, I'm not sure where Proverbs 2, 9 fits in here, into this whole thing. Now, you know, I was just reading from Proverbs 2 earlier, this morning, and it says this, then you understand what is right and just and fair, in every good path. And I thought, I thought about it for a long time, I go, What? How does this fit the fact of elevating man or Christ? They elevate man over Christ and it's being the counter to that. And then I realized, for wisdom will enter your heart. Who's wisdom? <laughs> Who is, who's wisdom, folks? Jesus Christ. 
He's the one. He imparts himself through the Holy Spirit to us. And knowledge will be pleasant. He goes on and says, and, and, and you'll understand what is right and just and fair and every good path. And I'm going there, okay. I realize that wisdom is that of truth. And we cannot let anything take over the place of Jesus Christ, who is truth. This morning, on this Sunday morning of July, I want to just begin to set the stage for us to understand what's culturally going on around us. And folks, we in the Midwest, and I say it because it's why isn't it interesting that people from the coast that don't like what's going on the coast are coming to the Midwest. <laughs> I say that. We're not perfect. We're sinners saved by grace if we know Jesus Christ. We're not perfect, but we have a value system that, yeah, it's affecting us. We're seeing the same problems here. We're looking for employees to show up and work, and they won't, like they are on the East Coast and the West Coast. But there's still a value system. There's still something there that says God is working in our lives and hearts yet. And people are saying there's something there they have that we don't have here. Or they're tired of being hammered all the time. I want to tell you something. We've got to be careful here because I'm afraid Satan has been turning up the heat. And we're starting to cook and we're not realizing we're about to get cooked royally. We dare not rest on our Midwest roots. We rest on the Word of God. Do I love the Midwest? I love it. I live in the country, love it. I like it, you know why? When I'm ready to do a garden, I'll do a garden. I can take care of myself. I'm going to have to do something with my well because the Lord decided to take, through nature, decided to take the windmill. <laughs> so I'm going to have to do something else for water. But the point is this. Out here, we can understand how we can, I properly say, take care of ourselves. But you know what? My God wants us to I be able, because we're not here to just take care of ourselves because that would be coveting. Now, hear that. We are called to take care of our own. It tells us that in Timothy. Now, my point is this. We're called to do so we can help others for the sake of Christ. It's not about us. What's mine is yours for the sake of Christ. We might be the agents of the ones that lead somebody to Christ. Just as our dear sister back here shared about Molly. You got to look at Molly. I would say Molly is probably one of the most unpretentious persons you ever meet. Would you agree, those that know Molly? Humble, serve the Lord. Her and Halal, how they meet? They met in San Francisco working at the mission we had there in the downtown part of San Francisco, the tough part of San Francisco. They found, they met each other, got in love, fell in love and got married. He brought her from the West Coast to here. And she didn't complain one. Molly's a very close friend of my wife's. But I'm looking and saying, that's what God wants us to become like that because we w we're glad that people are, I'll be honest, I'm glad people are coming this way because you know what it does? It gives us the opportunity to share the hope of Jesus, to say, you know what? And I know people are sharing Jesus there too. Don't think they're not. But culture is getting so it's squeezing them, they can't hardly hear or think. And they want to come here. We should not be arrogant, but we must be most careful. Because Satan's trying to turn up the fire under us. We've got to be discerners of the truth of God. We are living in a world that culture is trying to squeeze us out. And we need to be like that and pushing. Say, no, in Jesus' name. Uh-uh. <laughs> we have a mighty one. Yesterday, as I was at Cecilia's deal, Harry's sister was there. And there were several people kind of, and as I was kind of moving, suddenly without meaning to, she kind of got me with her knee, or elbow, or in my side. I said, you're just like your brother. I said, <laughs> but do what? And it was, it was a problem. It was no problem. It was just something. But as she was kind of moving because she was trying to make an adjustment and just give herself more space where she was standing. And the fact is, you know what? The world might be trying to squeeze us in, but we need to use God's. I said, let God help us use some of our spiritual elbows. Hold on. You're not going to run over me. I know what God's word says. I ain't going to get run over because I have a Lord who's already whipped you. <laughs> He's already whipped. Satan, you might be trying to use the world and people to come against me. 
that I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. This morning, I just want us to be thinking about what the culture is trying to do to us. Understand their mindset. And not be vicious in attitude, but be very astute in our response biblically. Does that make sense? What's the Bible tells us in Matthew 10? Stand firm. <laughs> you might get shoved around, you think. But when we stand in Christ, nobody can move us. What did Paul say in Romans? Either life or death. Principalities, powers, all can separate us or move us from the power. From what? From God. The love of God himself. Folks, don't get moved. Stand anchored in the word of God. Don't trust on what Pastor Stan said this morning. Trust in the word. Understand the cultural premise of what's happening around us. So we can speak and act. And be firm in a culture that's being easily pushed and swayed. That's why when we came back together June of 2020, we said, uh-uh, we're never closing our doors again. We're not. Why? We have a responsibility to worship our Lord corporately and individually. Something I think this whole church needs to see, and I'm going to have to show it to our young adults again, I think. We saw for a few weeks a DVD called Not a Fan. Not a Fan. What's it mean to not be a, just a fan of Jesus? We're called to be sold out, committed followers of Jesus Christ. Not to show up in church just when it feels convenient for us. We need to be a people that are totally committed to every aspect of God's call to us. Because I guarantee you, just like I saw on Facebook the other day, I saw it twice now. Saying, is this what the church should look like? If you're not in church, and it showed a herd of zebras, but there was one zebra being pursued by a lion because he got separated from the rest. I think we got a lot of people that are even part of this church, I'm afraid, that have gotten out there and they're going down fast because they separate themselves from the body of Christ. I'm sorry, folks. We need each other. We need each other. We hear his voice. That's right. So today, we have a culture that's trying to separate us from the herd. Say, you're not needed. I can exterminate you. Do away with you. That's called the cancel culture. It's been around in many forms, in many ways. That's just the term now. We got to be people that stand against it and stand firm for Jesus Christ. Every one of you is of value in the worth of God's sight, perfect in every way through His righteousness. Let's not be ashamed to stand for Him. Let's pray. Lord, today. Make us fearless because the one who was fearless has already conquered everything that could come against us. For he's like that big rock that leaned against those bulls. We know, Lord, you're the mighty one. And when bulls try to come after us, remind us we have the spirit of that rock in our hearts. Remind us that we're trying to be separated, but we've got to be more unified in the spirit loving each other caring for each other building each other let's not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ we love you and we want to be very attuned to what's going on around us but we are also to be attuned to the word of God to Jesus you ourself and the Holy Spirit to not be easily moved we stand firm and we know what's right. Give us that boldness by the Holy Spirit that comes beyond ourselves as we obey you. In Jesus' name we pray.
God's people said. Amen. 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 Go boldly in Christ as our calling is to do this, to serve the Western heritage culture of the Smoky Valley region by reaching the uncommitted for Jesus Christ. Go for it. Go in his power. Amen.